morning, everyone. Dr. Patel, Dr. Hu, uh, Professor Long, Ms. Dalton, good morning. And all our guests, good morning. My name is Michelle. It is my pleasure on behalf of the Center for Information Technology and Education of our university to welcome you all today. We are delighted to have you with us to participate and share in our Research Symposium 2019. Thank you for coming. We are honored to have Dr. Michael George Botello, the Clinical Associate Professor from the Faculty of Dentistry of our university, to share with us on his expertise in the use of videos to, to enhance student learning. And may I now hand over to Dr. Xiaohu, our University Associate Professor from the Faculty of Education, who will outline this keynote today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my honor and the pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker um, in this centers. Um, it's Dr. Michael Pitano. And then, um, um, since 1995, Dr. Motello has been joined um, Hong Kong U and in the Faculty of Dentistry. He has been very active in curriculum development and the scholarship of teaching and learning around the university. And, and he has um, developed and established and developed the um, dental problem-based learning, uh, which for some of us already know is actually award-winning. And over the years, he has also developed a particular part um, uh, skills and expertise in using video to enhance student learning, which is also award-winning. So um, actually, uh, over the years, uh, Dr. Patello has already published extensively and presented in many countries around the world. So today, uh, he brings us a speech titled in uh, If I Video, Will They Watch? Uh, it's a consideration for forward and reverse engineering um, for video uh, for uh, enhanced learning. So um, without further ado, let's welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Patello. is are all videos the same? And if you look at these and think about what, how they're made up, somebody's actually come up with a production style typology, which is very fortunate because they made a lovely little schematic about what are the different types of videos that there are available. 
And I thought that was really quite interesting. I'm quite familiar with some of these. I, used, I was using calm style videos with my children for revising maths and things like that. So, and I think they're excellent. They do great things. But if we look at these, there's actually two types of videos that I can see there. And I've come up with a classification about these because I think they're quite distinctly different. And that's monologue <coughs> and dialogue. Because I think there's significant power in dialogue, not only in the classroom, but in videos. So I'd like you to hold that thought, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. The power of dialogue in videos. What else can video do? Well, we know video gives us lovely affordances of things that we can achieve. We could use it as a virtual field trip to visit another place, still being in our own classroom. We can use it for maybe um, time uh, shrinking things so that you can make things speed up a bit like if you're doing a cooking show. And it allows you obviously to demonstrate things. And in dentistry, we've mainly focused on these two, demonstrations and manipulating time and space. So I make videos demonstrating to students how to do a psychomotor skill, how to cut a crown. And then we can also use it for doing clinical demonstrations about particular procedures and things like that. So that's very traditional. So what about when you want to make a video? What is it that you should be thinking of? Well, the first question is why? You've got to work out what's your motivation, what's your goal? Is it because you want it for your online course? Maybe it's a MOOC? Is there a particular problem you want to address? I like that one. Or have you just been told you've got to do it because it's the next hot thing and we're doing videos and that's the order of the day? Anyone from the medical centers? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I don't know if they have none. Okay, great. Um, right, so there's two ways about going about this forward and reverse engineering. And I'm going uh, to elaborate on that with some task design. Forgive me if you already know this. It's probably out there, but I came up with this when I did a few presentations. And I came up with, well, what are we doing if we're going to forward engineer? We've got the content that might be clearly divided designed and defined in, let's say, course learning outcomes. But really, it's a bit more than that. I think it's what you think is important. It's what your expertise has garnered over the years that makes you realize students have problems with this. I should therefore design that. That's why I think you're on a good track to developing uh, consumed videos. Wouldn't it be amazing if we actually asked the students what would you like to learn? What do they need help with? And what should we make for them? So you've got the content domain that we're focusing on there. But then you've got the purpose. And maybe we don't always think about this. And this is kind of getting into a Bloom's field. Uh, is it just at a very simple level, like knowledge and understanding? But if it's very simple stuff, do you really need a video? Because there are faster ways of assimilating knowledge than watching a video. Or are you looking at going up the taxonomy and do you want the higher order thinking skills if you're trying to get out of that learning experience in the video? Is there a particular skill set that you're looking for that you want them to achieve? Is it analysis or critique? Is it communication skills? Is it a performance skill that you want them to achieve? Because you've got to work out, do these things fit in with video? And when we're starting to plan this, one of the things I think we're quite dreadful at as educators, excuse me, is we don't talk about our pedagogy, pedagogy, sorry, and why we do what we do. And I think sometimes we need to explain that to students and make them realize, do you know what, we actually think about what we do. We put a lot of time and effort thinking about what we're doing and explain that such that they have an insight into what's happening. There's value, and this is, this is one that I don't know if people talk about much, but you've got to work out as an actual perceived value, and this is from the student's perspective. What do I mean by actual? Well, it's something tangible that they're really going to connect with, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Or is it a perceived one? Yeah, I think this might be useful for me. I should probably do this. So in some of the professional domains, we know that we have core knowledge and skills that we feel that they must not master or be able to do. Students will often see that. Dental students know they need to know how to place a filling. 
So they're motivated by that. There's a perceived and actual value. Or maybe what you're creating is the only source of that knowledge. Wouldn't that be amazing? I'll show you some examples of what I've created that is the only source of that knowledge. And that drives consumption. Maybe you're using videos to help students with regards to transitioning from one phase to another, or one environment to another. In dentistry, it's kind of like when we go from preclinical to clinical. How do you close that gap between theory and actual practice? And I've got some examples of that. And of course, exam-driven, that drives consumption. So therefore, how can you use exams to drive the consumption of your materials in a reasonable way. And of course, the other value is asynchronicity. Can students wait to use it when they want to? Because that will drive consumption. Students don't want to turn up at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning to go to a lecture. They do it because they have to, because they're told to, and maybe it's a requirement. So they're in the lecture, but you don't know if they're cognitively with you. That's one of the delusions of being a lecturer. And that's why I think lecturing is quite bad if not very bad. So therefore, we've got these elements that we're talking about. We've kind of like got the what and the why, but there's one that's missing, this is the how, and this is the one that I think is useful to work out how we pull this all together. So now we are thinking about the pedagogy and what we're trying to achieve. Third time, lucky, I'm very right. Um, and the, um, therefore, if you're going to use video, you've got to work out, well, if I video, will they watch? I think if you are able to pull in and think of those elements in your task design when you're forward engineering, then I think the answer is predominantly yes. Are you going to get 100%? No. Nope. Unless you make it compulsory. Unless you do some tasks that means they have to do it before they move on to the next one. I don't make any of my videos compulsory because I don't want them to do it for the sake of it. And I see a figure that makes me look, wow, aren't I great? So all my videos are not compulsory. Although I did it once, and I'll elaborate on that, what happened there, that was a disaster. So, now I look at the videos we use in dentistry, or videos for clinical learning in general. There is a lot out there. And maybe in your domain, there is a similar number. And students love watching videos, and when they get some time, they like the passive learning. They do like a bit of spoon feeding, don't we all? <coughs> We have a problem, we'll Google it. We'll watch a video on it to see how it explains it. We're all doing it. And in dentistry, there's a lot of things that help students with regards to uh, what it is they're trying to examine when they're looking at the video. But one of the problems is, and my colleague, uh, Xiao Li, uh, looked at this with some health science faculty, nursing, medicine, dentistry. And when, what she found was students, yes, love watching videos, but because they perceive them to have variable quality. They're not from here, so they don't know how it applies to their context. Uh, and it doesn't get discussed. So they don't know, what well, is it relevant? Is it useful? I've watched it, does it apply? I've got some knowledge, can I trust it? So therefore, there's insecurities about that. And therefore, that would drive us to consider, should we be making our own videos so they are contextually appropriate and they're designed for what, our, what we're trying to achieve? So, the question, do you really need to make your own videos? Because they're quite time consuming. They can be. Um, if you're going into a green room and having stuff like that, I've done it. And to think you can just talk for three minutes without interruption and hesitation, deviation, uh, and get it out, it's really quite difficult to do that perfect performance. You've really got to be quite polished. But I think there's other ways of making useful videos. And do you need to make a video from scratch? No, you don't. There's other videos out there. Why don't you see what's out there? Go, do you know what? That's from the University of Ruhr, wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what? That's not bad. That, that matches pretty much what we want to use in our course. And I write a note. So this is what we're doing in radio, on a radiology course. We like this video because of this, this, and this. However, we disagree with that. We've endorsed that. We've clarified it. We've given the students some context. And we're going to be uploading those for students to learn, learn from until we get around to making our own. So don't be frightened to borrow others. You don't have to make your own. My first videos I made years ago uh, were instructional videos, how to do, a bit of a cooking show thing. Um, uh, kind of, here's one I didn't make earlier. 
uh, because I do it in the moment, and so they see it from start to finish. Uh, but of course, these are monologues. Uh, I can zoom in on things. That's the affordance of video to do macro. Uh, I can even speed it up if I want to, but I don't do that. I let the students do it when they watch it, and I know they do that. I mean, we all do it, speed listening. We want the information first and first and first. Yeah? So they watch it faster, and we can go through and demonstrate the whole procedure. I chunk it down into sections. So a long video gets chunked down because I thought that was a good idea. So therefore, when we look at these kind of monologue videos, yes, it's, you know, it, it, it does what it's meant to do and it's purposeful, but it's not particularly exciting. But there's maybe not a lot that you can do. And on these types of videos, if I video, will they watch? Well, it depends. When I made that video back there, and it was all whistles and bells and new and lovely, and I said, do you know what? Why don't we tell the students, watch it before you come in, We'll save time, that'll give us more time in the class and you get more time to practice. Isn't that a good idea? Great, we agreed on that. So then the next week, we get to the class, they're starting off, and I'm looking around, I'm seeing people, I'm looking, and they're a bit even slower to get started than they normally are. And eventually they get around to doing things, and some know what they're doing and some don't. And I'm kind of like, pretend my team, I'm saying, it's very clear what we have done last week. So I go over to the Moodle system and I log on and I look at, let's see who's watched this video. About 25 to 30% did not. I wanted to go through the roof, but I couldn't. Because it's, I couldn't reach it. And it's, so then I calmly said, okay, look, I know who you are. <laughs> I have the information here and I can see who's watched and who hasn't watched. I'll give you an amnesty. You can go downstairs and I made them go, oh, it's dreadful. I made them go to the furthest corner of the hospital, into our PBL suite, downstairs, ground floor, all the way along the corridor, to go watch the video. And I made them go, oh, no, 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 no. I went down with them and said, right, watch the video, and then come all the way back, and they went too. I learned the lesson, not them. If it's important, you don't let students watch it out of the class. So now I brought it back into the class, unfortunately. It was a nice idea, but it didn't work. And we watch the video in the class so I know that they're all there watching the video. Trouble is, they fall asleep watching the video. <laughs> so you have to wander around the class and now and again just go like that. Yeah? And then we thought, okay, okay, what are we going to do to make them not fall asleep? Aha! Give them a task. Yeah? Because they have difficulty in keeping attention. It's after lunch. I empathize with that. I used to fall asleep in my orthodontic seminar. There was eight of us. The lights would go down, the slides would go on, and my tutor would just gently nudge me. So I do empathize. I do empathize with that. So, therefore, if you're going to do a video like that, you've got to work out you should have a task based assignment. It's a little bit cheeky, but it does focus them. You know, they are hunting for it, watch it, and then. Or maybe you get them to watch a video and you say, right, I want you to watch this video from this perspective. I want you to consider what are the communication skills happening here? Or what, are the, uh, what do you disagree with? Or what do you think about this principle of... So you're giving them a task and as they're watching it, they're doing a comparison as they're going through it. And they're not a passive observer. Because you want students to be cognitively active when they're watching videos. And if you don't, they'll fall asleep. So I think that's important to do. The other way is you actually make the video cognitively engaging. So you don't give them a task to do, you make the content cognitively engaging. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? How do you do that? Well, I came across an accidental innovation. Um, our students learn to do crowns and bridges in the fourth year. And it's in the fifth year, or now the sixth year, when they actually go into the clinics and provide that treatment for the patients. So you've got the theory, and you've got the practice, and in the middle, you've got the transition gap, the jump between preclinical and clinical, when you've learned the theory and when you're going to apply it. And the students get a little bit anxious, because they kind of go, well, I know you taught us about how to do it like this, but how does that apply to this case on this patient for this scenario? Is it still the same? And they're looking for a bit of affirmation. And so I get students coming along and I hear, I'd look up, I'd duck behind their monitor, they'd knock again, they know I'm in the office, all right, come in. 
So they come in, I say, what do you want? And they say, we've got some questions. OK, great. I go through a Socratic dialogue with the students. OK, why are you doing it like that? What's the purpose? How is that different to this? If it was like this, how would that alter your decision making? So we slowly go from a problem from the student to the end. They get it. They go, oh, great. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you. They walk out the door. I'm there going, that was really good. That was a really interesting little teaching moment that's been lost to the rest of the class. And so that's when I thought, hang on, I'm going to video that. I'm going to video capture that dialogue and that exchange. I'm going to upload it onto the learning management system for other students to learn from. So that's how I, that's how I went about reverse engineering. And over time, I learned out what I was doing and why it was useful, and I'll share that with you now. So what happens is, the student comes because they've got a particular problem about something they don't understand. So this is student-oriented, student-generated, student-relevant. They come to my office, and we have a chit-chat, and we discuss it. And in Bradley, there's models and articulators and things that we're going to be looking at there. And so therefore, what I did was I just simply started using my phone, putting it on a tripod, focusing on the, de the desk and the models, not the student, not the faces. And we go through our Socratic discourse from start to, proper, uh, start to finish. I then upload it onto the learning management system. It's unlisted on YouTube, so you can't find it. Um, I do it like that because I think that's nicer for the students, because I'm not looking to promote them or me or anything like that. And then, of course, the students then get the opportunity to be able to uh, watch it when they want it, when they need it. Uh, and there's a little video about this uh, that you can find on that QR code. Over time, I've developed quite a library of different videos. Very few monologues, mainly dialogues. I've got over 100 different video clips. Uh, I've categorized them. I've given them titles, and I've also given them keywords so students can see, is this relevant to me? You've got to work out, if you're using a video, how you allow students to find what they want with the least path of resistance. Mm -hmm. Once you make it more difficult, more challenging, the con I swear the consumption will go down. So I did an evaluation of this, my community consultation videos, and we got some very nice results. Self-reported, I know, so I think they inflated a bit, but you know, they felt that it gave them experience and confidence clinically when they're treating patients in their fifth year, and it helped them transition to that environment. Uh, it helps them prepare for the, the care of their patient, and it broadens their experience. They're learning from other students' cases and other students' problems. It's a very wonderful, vicarious learning opportunity. This took me a bit by surprise, and this is what I think is most interesting. The students situate themselves in the video as if they're answering my question when I'm in the video with the student. They compared, and this is some more recent data, they compared their answer to the student's answer, and they go, oh, this is the student right, am I right? And there's a bit of a pause, and they might even pause the video, they're interacting with it, some of them, to pause, think of the answer, and then play it. So that's the affordance that video allows you to do. And, uh, okay, so they're learning higher order thinking skills that they can apply to their own cases. And this is interesting, because of the video, they say that they're less likely to have to go and seek a consultation. So it's like a virtual consultation that they're having through this vicarious experience. A uh, couple of papers, and that's the little video clip that explains this narrative. And it, it got made into an amazing little story. It, it's really quite cute. I won't play it now. Um, but what I did was I started to dissect and reverse engineer well, what's going on here? Why is it useful? And what I started to work out what well, the student is presenting with a problem, yeah? Student generated, student relevant content. One of the reasons why students make better teachers than teachers is because they know better what they don't know than what we think they don't know. There's a disconnect on that. They also explain it in a beginner's language, which is why beginners are better than teachers, and why small group teaching is really the only way to go uh, with peer-to-peer -peer teaching. Um, 
We then go through this discourse. So I'm using my Socratic approach, my Socratic questioning. The student has case materials that we're referring to in the video that makes it visually rich. The student is answering. As we go along from that moment, I'm laying a pathway from where they're going from their question to where I want to get them to the end. And I'm guiding them using my expertise of what I want to probe their understanding for and help them construct their own answer. So it's a guided problem-solving pathway. And eventually, we get to the answer. And students consider these video vignettes, model answers about what's happening in the moment. So they start from, I don't know how to do it, to I know how to do it, from having watched that vicarious experience. And so therefore, this pulls in the elements that we're thinking of with regards to the, uh, the task design, and this will drive consumption. And I don't know if you notice this, I forgot to show that. I've changed the name now. I no longer call it the communal consultation video. That was the idea of one-on-one -on -one sharing to the larger card. Now I've understood the key elements. I've now called it a VD video, and that's basically short for Video Expert Student Dialogue. And it's the expert student that's a key element in what's happening in this learning pathway that's recorded. So the power of this, okay, so we've got the, we've got the Socratic discourse, which is the expert-guided, student-centered uh, accounts. You've got the beginning to end, problem going to uh, solution. And because of the dialogue, students are cognitively engaged. And this slide is still a work in progress. I'm still working out what's happening on this. Uh, we've got a model answer. We've got higher order thinking skills. It's translational because they're learning how to think of the theory to the practice. And of course, it's observer controlled. And then the dot, dot, dot is the other stuff that I'm extracting now. And I've got a student who's working on that paper I'm submitting uh, this week to explain that. So when I did that, I was really pleasantly surprised. There was nice consumption. They liked it, and I thought, how else can I use this? You know, there, there must be other ways of doing this. So what can I do? Well, I do an awful lot. I only do, in my course, I only do um, small group, student-centered learning activities. I don't stand up and do monologues. And so therefore, and what I do to drive these learning events is I use worksheets. Uh, and I call them synthetic clinical experience worksheets because they're learning about clinical things in the non-clinical environment. So I consider that to be synthetic clinical experience. And uh, some of it might be a little bit uh, at the knowledge and understanding level, and some of it might be a particular scenario that they have to analyze and understand or other worksheets about how do you judge and discriminate features of quality and what you're going to do in your performance. Can you self-evaluate accurately? Because that's an important skill as a healthcare professional. You've got to know quality and know your limitations. So that's one of the things we do. So, week one, I give out the worksheet. I say, please complete this. Uh, we need to have it ready for next week. They're very obliging students, and the vast majority of them do. Then we would come back and we're working on doing our crown preps and doing stuff like that and go, right, 30 minutes, we're going to start doing the worksheet. 15 minutes, we're going to start, you've got to do the countdown. Because you, you can't say, we're going to start now because that's like, you know, that's like herding cats. They just, you've got to build up to that moment and then you've got to repeat three times, just like you've got children, uh, so that they understand what it is that you're going to start doing. And you've got to remind them. And it gets a bit frustrating, but you get into the flow of it. So the students gather in notable groups. I say, right, I want you to discuss in your groups. I want to clarify what you understand, what you don't understand. Because then they know we're going to have the group debriefing. So they spend about half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour on that. Uh, they've done the homework before, and then they uh, uh, discuss it in the class. You could do, uh, do it all in the class. I do that as another model when I'm doing in a lecture theater when I haven't seen the students before. But this one I do, they, they've got from the week before. Then I'm the roving reporter, and I go, so question one, what do you think? Like that. And, they talk, and then we go through the semantic dialogue, I check their understanding. And so in a way, you've got vicarious observation of that teaching moment, I've just realized. But this is real time rather than video. So it's still expert student dialogue. I've just realized that. Expert student dialogue, but it's in the moment. 
and it's aligned performance. And that's what we're doing there. So then what I do is I thought, well, let's video these because I know what's going to happen to students. They're going to get that worksheet. And when they get to the exam, they're going to look at it and they go, I don't get that. I know. I, I wrote. So I, I understand that bit, but not that bit. I mean, I'm sure you never have that problem, but I do. You write stuff down, and you never quite remember what it is when you get. To. So what I thought is, well, if I can recreate that moment for them, they can go back and watch it. But you might be able to see well, that's a very long video, and the recommended guideline for video length is how long? How many? Ten? Five? Close. Okay, there's one study that says six, six to nine. That was done, and it's flawed, but uh, everyone quotes that one a lot. But there's six to nine minutes. And I disagree with that because it depends the value of the video, it depends how important it is, it depends on stuff. If you're just casually surfing, if you're doing a MOOC, yeah, you'll get bored. And that data came from a MOOC because people don't value it and they're not so engaged in it. So it, it's, uh, it's correct, but incorrect at the same time. But I realized after a while, do you know what? That, that's difficult to access. How are they going to find what they want? How do I facilitate the path of least resistance to get in there? So then I had students watch it for me and identify when I asked the questions. And so I timestamped them. And I put that into YouTube, such that when they're looking at their worksheet, if they get to question nine in a different question, which is in a different case, they can click on that, it takes them to that moment. And so it facilitates that. I haven't done the analytics on that. This is my next to-do project uh, that I'm going to be looking at. And I think they've already started using it in a different way to which I intended it, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, how else can I help students? Well, we have another scenario where our students will be pleased to know if they need to do a procedure on a patient, and it's a critical one, we assess them very robustly that they're safe to do it. But because of the robustness of the assessment, and it's summative, there's consequences if they fail, it's a high stakes assessment. And so they get insecurities and stresses about that test, because they're not so quite sure about the case selection criteria, which case am I going to bring in for treatment. They're also not sure about the assessment standards, because we all know assessment is a black box uh, for many students. We don't elaborate and discuss this very much. Um, and so what I did was I started recording summative clinical skills assessment on the clinic with students using a similar approach, and I had different categories, and these are not all of them because if you scroll down the page, but there are basically three types. One is case suitability, uh, that's, that's probably done in my office. Uh, the self-evaluation is, is done on the clinic immediately before they start treating the patient, and the case presentation is the, oh no, the self-evaluation is at the end, it's out of order, and the case presentation is at the beginning. So let me show you what that is. So this is at the beginning, this is at the presentation, and I might be asking, so what are you going to do today? Why are you going to do it? Who, who's, uh, what, what does the patient want? Why are you going to do it this way and not that way? How are you going to do it? So that's the video before they do the competence test. That then means uh, I know that they're safe and they've got the knowledge to proceed. Then they perform the clinical procedure. That takes an hour or two hours or something like that. Then they come back and we do the self-evaluation. How did the procedure go? What went well? Tell me about the design you've outlined on this model that you've just done on the patient, because they pulled this up in stone and it demonstrates what they've actually done on the patient. Do you think you've met the standard and have passed? So we recorded those and made those available. And if ever you needed to see a graph on assessment drives the learning, the CT is the competence test. And these are all the key, key skills, video expert student dialogue. And you can see the consumption one to two weeks, nay, days before their uh, presentation uh, or case, when they are going through tremendous consumption. Let me just let me just quickly show you what some of these look like, just so you've got a little bit of a context about what they look okay, like. So now we're going to start the uh, label preparation. I can see on this tooth when I look at the contour, we've got a flat surface in the coronal tooth. Uh, so that's the monologue. So, question two. 
looking at the truth crime, what principle is that trying to show you? This is the worksheet debriefing. Balls. Uh, that's bruised on the truth crab, and uh, they try to increase the resistance form. And then I follow up with another question. This is to do with treatment planning. Mm -hmm. This is the transition mm -hmm. thing. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So, what do you want to ask? Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the treatment style is to I'd like to, this is a 50 year old year patient, I'd like to replace yeah. the, two, uh, the, three, the, the two five with such and such because da da da. So that's the problem that they've got. I don't know whether I should do this or do that. And then this is the competence test video. Do we have your permission to use this for teaching and learning? So that's on the clinic. You can't quite hear, but there's people banging doors, there's drills going in the background. Sorry, the sounds of it, you probably didn't want to hear the drills in the background. But the uh, but but uh, there's a little bit quiet. So they're, they're, they're the different types of videos that, that I'm using. Um, and now I'd like you to, to share with you video box. Because I think we haven't quite done enough with our videos and we need to consider how we make them more interactive. So this is kind of like a, a video a learning management platform. It allows contextual, time-specific discussion for the opportunities of maybe questions and answers, feedback or comments on the video that is up there. It's suitable for the flipped class or MOOCs, uh, and it provides some analytics that we're developing further in how you can understand what's going on. There's a little infomercial video, if you want to have a look at that, I won't play it. Um, that was the one where I had to do it in one shot to get it right, and I almost did it. But you fluff your words when you do that. So, no, no, you miss this word, you miss that word, you miss the other word. And so then you have to go back and redo it. And do you know what? Talking in front of a camera and memorizing your script puts you into cognitive overload like you cannot believe. You forget to smile, you, uh, you know, you're like, yeah. you look at yourself, oh, God, I look so miserable. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so basically, what you've got to do is you've just got to chat. So I wouldn't recommend doing those. Just do off-the-cuff chit-chat, and that's all you need to do. I forgot to say, all the communal consultation videos are one-shot recordings. I don't do any editing. I don't have time for that. So this allows you to present your course. You have the resources that are in here. This happens to be Ricky Kwok's course in computer science. Um, it allows you to display content on a week weekly basis, or maybe you want to use domains or categories or subjects on that side. When you click on one of those, it then shows you the content that you have over there. That could be files, web links, videos, whatever type of file you want to have in there, more or less, not every file. Uh, it allows students, when they log on, to see what they've uh, watched and what they haven't watched. Uh, here is uh, Ricky's layout, and you can put in little things like, I don't think you still have that, I think you changed it, the up and down, uh, the little funny thing. I didn't like that, the tech designers wanted it, and eventually they changed their mind. Uh, but he's getting a lot of people watching his videos, yeah? Uh, more than mine, uh, but we've got a smaller cohort. Uh, and uh, Matthew Price has been using it in his course, and so he's really been using the discussion board underneath the contemporaneous discussion board in the monologue video that he's presenting. So he's getting them to think about something, he's asking them to comment on it from a particular perspective. Um, we also design keyword tags. So these are uh, teacher design keywords that you can put next to the video. They're now underneath it, we change the design. And you may want something like, uh, I understand, I don't understand, I didn't get it. That's really cool. Uh, can we have more examples of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could have something like that. That will then allow you to see in the video timeline where those things occurred. However, what I thought it would be really useful for is, how can you code communication events? Or how can you code a particular performance? So you can put on your particular keywords down here. You can have people watch it, and they can enter what they think is happening in that teaching moment. 
Nicole Tavares, one of our amazing teachers in CAS, she saw the value of this immediately, and she said, I kind of suggested it, because this is where I saw the value of it. Teaching practicums. Get teachers to upload their performance in the classroom. Uh, and that's a long performance. That's one, you can't see it, one hour, 23 minutes. And then she said, right, I'm, I'm gonna, she wanted, wow, that was good. Um, which I mentioned te in technical English language speak means, oh, I'm not so sure about that. And then there's oh dear, which is probably something that didn't go quite according to plan. And so therefore they can tag that moment in the video and then they can give feedback on that moment that is time uh, context specific. And we're working out how we can, uh, you know, you can have the, the person's name, it could be anonymous. I like the idea of the name because you're more accountable and you'll think more about what you're doing. Uh, and you can uh, categorize the type of uh, thing you're leaving as a comment or a question. Um, and you can see now we've got this cute little thing that along the timeline you can see where all these events occurred. Yeah? So there's no red events happening in there, so they must have done quite well. But look at the consumption. This is a small teaching class, but there's 400 views on that. That goes on for like 11 pages. Okay, they're not like that long, but it's 11 pages of dialogue that's going along. I want to find out how they're using it, how they find it useful and whatever. So if anyone's interested in helping out, let me know. Um, and then we've got some analytics. Uh, the analytics is a work in progress. Uh, but we can see when classes are watching and when students are watching it and things like that. So with all these things, video is just a technology as a tool. It's how you use the tool to get to the result that's important. And it should be driven by your task design or what you think it is you're trying to achieve. So if they video, will they watch? We know learners are huge consumers of video, and I don't know if we're tapping into this in a constructive way. Because we've got to be thinking about task design, reverse engineering, and also considering how can we use expert student dialogue videos with a particular context or purpose. Is it for translational of knowledge? Is it for the flip class? Is it to get students familiar with assessments? We can use it for communication skills. Students can do reports in, in video box about their electives, and people can give comments and feedback on it, uh, similar to what uh, Nicole was doing. And then also you can have analysis and feedback on student-generated content. We've also got to think about how we facilitate the access to the, make it easier for the students to get to what they want. And we could consider what are the novel technologies like video box and whatever's going to come next that's going to help us affect better teaching and learning for our classrooms. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a Really, very, very instructive. I was just wondering um, how effective it would be uh, for the teacher to actually learn from the experience mm. and to improve on their own performance. Oh, I mean on the analytics. Okay, how can the analytics help? At the moment, my, from my understanding, the analytics is generally not good. No one's doing it very well at the moment. Uh, we're looking to how we can improve that on video box. So for example, on some of the older videos, you know the student clicked on the video, you don't know if they watched it, you don't know all, you don't know if they paused it. So therefore, if you have that data, you get an idea of which of the, if the students are watching all the video, then you know they're probably, it was available. If they are all pausing it at a particular place, you're going, is there some, did I, did I you know, put my finger in my ear and look really dull at that moment? Or was there something that was very challenging that they wanted to understand? And so that might give you an alert there. Uh, the other thing about the, um, uh, the analytics about the consumption is you might be looking at it from a class perspective, or you might be looking at it from an individual student. And so what I think is really interesting, because my videos are not compulsory, so therefore I will be able to find, and I'm, this is a study I'm doing now with students, about uh, approaches to learning, and whether there's a connection to video consumption, or analytics, or access to the learning management system, and exam results. Because I think you're gonna find, 
internally motivated students are going to be the ones who are going to consume more. But we're not really worried about those, because those students succeed almost regardless of all those intentions. They will fly and float and do amazingly well. It's the bottom 20 to 30% or 40%. We've got to work out how do we nudge them to engage more. So if you know who those students are from the analytics, you then have an opportunity to work out how do we go about nudging them. How do we move them up the scale of consuming some more? And you know, there's ideas about badges or rewards or you know, how, do you, uh, how do you rate relative to your peers and things like that. So that will allow you to identify. If you've got those analytics, you can then target who are the ones that might be struggling, not engaging. Maybe they're sick, maybe there's problems at home. It can open up all sorts of insights that we would have never had opportunities of seeing before. Um, how else can it help from the analytics? Yeah, I think that's, that's some, some interesting things just there. So I don't think monologue videos have a lot of power unless you're explaining something that is conceptually challenged, that you know that is difficult. Therefore, is there a way that you can make the video interactive? Therefore, that you, you're going to find benefit about that. Whereas I think the ones that Nicole's using, and maybe Matthew, where you're getting students to interact, you're going to be able to see, are they interacting in a meaningful way? Are they just doing it because it's their task design and they just got to do it? And so therefore they're engaging but not really that well. And I think you're going to find a range of those things. So I think teachers are going to find, it's going to, the video box will give opportunities not possible before. I think students are going to engage with it more. Uh, Nicole's taken to it very well. Uh, and you, know, you can see the consumption going on there. So there's stuff going on, but as yet we haven't had time to analyze it because we've only done it in a few courses. And it will be richer in some domains for its use and benefit than perhaps in others. And so again, it's a tool. So you've got to choose the right tool for the pedagogy and the outcomes that you're looking for. Uh, but yes, I, I think there's things to look at. There's research to be done. Yeah. Have you considered using standards like LTI or XAPI to let your system integrate with another LMS that somebody might be using so that um, you could have a course, for example, in Moodle, which is used here, yeah. and call out to um, your server with its tagging, its, its um, really interesting uh, data tracking, mm -hmm. and report that uh, use by the student back to the Moodle system so that it could be included in more comprehensive learning analytics. Yeah. Uh, so are you saying, how can this be upgraded into other things? No, we haven't looked at that angle yet. Um, and I probably need to come along to your presentation because I don't know what the analytics are in Moodle. But generally, I found them not to be quite opaque and not very helpful. Uh, because they're very clunky. Yeah. And so therefore, a lot of the, uh, those analytics of the consumption spiking up when it's in time for the compute for the of course, you have to download an Excel file. You then have to extract the URL link that corresponds to that video by, through a sorting process to filter it down. You then need to extract teacher from non-teacher or student from non-student access. Then you're left. With the, then you've got to identify the cohort to filter through. So there's kind of like various stages you have to go through. So if there's something now that's faster, better, quicker, then that, that'll be amazing. Yeah, okay, it's great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Mike. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And um, so this is the, um, well, I don't think about video too much, but. You've really done a lot of thinking in terms of uh, what kinds of videos and what kinds of interactions and 
how to actually um, the pose viewing of the of the video is also uh, very useful. Um, I've been working on learning design, and I've been very much thinking. I mean, I've been thinking for many years about how can we have a language to describe design. Yeah. And I think uh, it would be fantastic if you can actually think about, um, you know, you actually have a lot of those languages there, mm -hmm. and you're building a tool. So, um, so if you can have a, a language for a video design for education, yeah. and then there's also the language for um, interaction and analytics yeah. and feedback. I think that is wonderful because thinking about the, the feedback, um, we could have crowdsourced um, sorts of analysis so most of the students stop here. We can also have, say, the students who, so what would be the kind of average grade for the students who stop or who do not stop? And, and so you could, I mean, one could have rather pinpoint and say, well, you haven't stopped here. Or, well, most of the people who don't, who stop here actually got a higher grade, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And, and so, so, so that's one thing. But also, um, say, you give the students a kind of like, um, I mean, okay, so that was um, the Nicole's um, video. They were sort of watching, looking out for moments. But they can also, but any video, you could in fact create hacks for students to actually uh, stem. Mm. And, and then, so they could also, that can also be a kind of like um, a basis for people to discuss the video. So we all watch this 10 minute video. Yeah. And then we look at, and then of course the text if is designed by the teacher. You have some foci. You can also have students uh, suggesting text. Yeah. And so, so this is so, so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. That's right, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, the, um, yeah, the, the, the opportunities and directions that, that you can take this and what I've got planned for next um, is, is, uh, is quite exciting. And the, um, I think the, uh, your idea of crowdsourcing, you know, you can put a video up there, you can have students go through it and code it for you. And then you can then identify what are the key moments that we're going to discuss. And so let's say you've got the bits where you're putting up some content and you want students to identify the idea is the traffic lights system, isn't it? Green, understand, yellow, not just sure, red is difficult. And once you've got that in your timeline, you can then work out if, let's say, the other thing you've done, that I've been thinking of doing is on the video timeline, you may be able to segment the timeline according to concepts or questions, or whatever, and so you can see the color code as you go along there. And then when you see more reds and yellows, you go, right, we've got to go over that one, that one, and that one. So that will answer your question. How can teachers know what students don't understand? Is you're looking for these, these things where you've got the, the keyword button, traffic light, whatever, saying, I don't understand this. Then in the next class, you can go, right, most of you had a problem with this. Let's, I've designed a task. Let's see how we get, uh, get on with that one. All sorts of ideas. But you've got to be careful about it. all of a sudden you're thinking, oh great, students don't have to come into the classroom anymore. They're going to be watching videos <laughs> at home. They're going to have so much to watch. Yeah. Oh, medical faculty, very careful of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Learning is a social experience. You must have interaction. You must have face-to-face -face time. If you don't, you're not going to get consumption. You're going to get very unhappy campers, as we say. If you think you can put everything online and, oh, it's, it's a great lecture, yeah, put it there, it's great, oh, we'll say you've got some money, you know, uh, you're going to have your, your scores, your CTLs, uh, the student evaluation of teaching and learning is surely going to go down. So you can have the video for some contextual thing and then you get them into the classroom to apply, discuss, analyze, whatever. Thank you, Michael. And you shared with us a lot of uh, strategies to encourage students to watch the videos before the class. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, based on your observation, what's, uh, what's the difference between students who watch the video and those who didn't watch the video? Uh, to what extent, whether the watching video will affect their in-class and the final performance? 
Uh, good question. Well, I'm, do I'm doing that research now, so I'm looking at analytics of this. I'm going to compare that to a student's um, approaches to learning inventory, John Biggs wants service to be, and then we're going to look at some exam scores. And so we're going to be able to look at that. Now, we don't have the analytics to in the class to easily see which students are watching and not watching, because really, you want these analytics to identify the younger achievers, mm -hmm. to work out whether you need to have a chat with them, how's things going at home. Uh, I notice you haven't been watching that many. Do you realize you've watched five videos where the average for the class is 20? You know, do you feel you're, you've got a mastery of the subject? Um, so I think that's where you're going to see benefit. So I don't think at the moment I can, I'm able to know in the moment, with the current Google platform, I can't see who's watching and who isn't. Um, although I did on one occasion, I was doing the competence test, the performance one, on the patient. The student was in just past, just past, and I said, I bet he didn't watch any videos. Yeah, didn't watch any videos. Didn't prepare, didn't have the knowledge, wasn't able to articulate, didn't understand how to present. Um, so that really does modify. So now, uh, students are having high consumption of those videos and, and they've shifted from, unfortunately, they've shifted from the treatment planning ones and now they're just focusing on the key skills. So now I've got to design a task, this is what I think is happening, how do I get them to consume the treatment planning videos? So now I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to design an assessment and it's going to be based around the content in the treatment planning videos because I want them to consume that and have mastered that knowledge. And so now I'm having to based on the analytics that I think I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to have to re-engineer what I'm doing, reverse engineer, and change how they were used to how they're currently being used. So according to your observation, the video watching is very critical to their performance. I, I think there's a chicken and egg. You've got the, the students who are highly motivated and will do quite well are the ones who watch the videos. And so you've got that thing going on there. The students are a bit laid back and you know, they, they, they won't be watching it, so therefore they won't perform as well. So you're not sure whether the video is really needing the performance or whether it's a reflection of the, pers of the student's personality or their approach to learning. I once did a small study on this topic. It's a quasi-experiment study. I want to uh, see uh, how important the pre-class video watching behavior. Mm -hmm. And I found that the video watching behavior only affect their engagement behavior. So those who watch more, they also uh, attend more in class. Yeah. But the in-class uh, performance and the final achievement is not much affected. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really interested in what's, the, uh, what's about your comments. Yeah. But then you see, it might be affecting other things, because there's more to learning than just the outcome. You know, there's the confidence, there's the enjoyment, there's the, you know, do they retain the knowledge longer than that one assessment? <coughs> you know, does it somehow enrich that? And of course, if it's video, they can always go back to it, but you can't do that in the classroom unless you record it. But uh, very, very interesting, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Thank you for your very informative talk, especially you mentioned um, teaching using videos in teaching medicine, all right? Um, I, I, I'm thinking um, the teachers usually spend a lot of time uh, want the student to watch the video, and then in return, when we analyze the student performance, sometimes uh, it could be disappointing. Um, we could not tell whether the performance um, you know, is very effective by just uh, watching the video. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking that uh, any experience from you, um, in, um, instead of uh, asking the student to prepare a video presentation, you know, we normally have uh, um, you know, case presentation or yeah. or whatever presentation. But instead of speaking that orally, ask the student to prepare a video presentation. Yeah. And then afterwards, followed by questioning time. Do you think the the learning outcome will be more effective than the teachers use video conventional video to teach the student? Excellent question. I would say yes and no, and it depends. So it will matter a lot to the student who prepares the content, because they will have mastered it tremendously. Uh, they may be using a language that's easier for peers to understand. 
peers might be more attentive to the peers' presentation, particularly if they're giving them feedback, because there might be there's a bit of emotional engagement. I forgot one of the questions in the video in my uh, expert student dialogue. Students reported they felt emotionally engaged to the student in the video because they felt a bit sorry for them. Because <laughs> they were being asked nasty questions by the professors. So you do get that emotional engagement. It's another aspect to learning that we don't always think of that could be happening in that video moment. So I think that's an excellent idea. I love the idea about students engaged with pedagogy and creating content. But you've got to work out the value of it. Uh, you can't do a lot of it because it's quite exhausting. I did a system using Peerwise where we use student-generated questions to test peers. And it's a fantastic experience, but it takes a lot of time and effort to do. So it's something you can do occasionally. Uh, and then you've got to work out, well, what is it in particular about the content? It's got to be something that's really going to be impactful, not something that's a bit boring. So I'm sorry, biochemical pathways might not be the top of the list. But if it's the impact of biochemical pathways in, in uh, symptoms of patients, then that changes the context. And all of a sudden, you're raising it because you've got to learn about those patients and how it has impact. So again, it's down to that task design element. But I think it's a great idea. Uh, and we can, I don't know if we've got it at the moment whereby we can have lots of students uploading stuff. Uh, at the moment, we can do small numbers. We've got to work out that it can do more. But my next platform that I'm wanting to design is one where it's peer-to-peer -peer feedback and assessment. And so you can upload and so you'll be able to design a rubric and you'll be able to upload content that might be video or text-based and you'll be able to get students to go through it, grade it. And ideally you have multiple students evaluating one piece of work. You've got the benefit of them understanding assessment, you've got the benefit of them learning from another student's perspective so they get a broader experience. Uh, and then they've learned something in the process. So that's the next kind of like thing that I'm looking at. Well, um, I'm sure there are more questions that people wanted to discuss with Michael, um, but um, we are aware of time. So um, let's um, thank our speaker again. Thank you very much.